The title of my Scott talk is Fighting Scots, How a Kidnapped Teen Became the First Social Influencer to Challenge Human Trafficking. For my Scott talk at homecoming, I was asked to share something from my teaching that might be of interest to Gordon alumni. Our Fighting Scots mascot gave me a hint. Um, I chose a topic from my advanced seminar on Celtic Christianity that I'm teaching this, this semester. And while the fighting part of the story will be clear, I think, I think I need to ch clarify the Scots part a bit more. Historically, the term Scots refers to the Latin Scoti, a people who were originally from Ireland, who then settled in other parts of the world, including that place we call Scotland. And because mission, missions will be a theme of my talk, I'll open with Christ's commandment to his disciples. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Today we are talking about the remotest part of the earth, at least the region that would have seemed to be the most remote to the author of that text, the evangelist Luke. We are talking about St. Patrick, and I love talking about Patrick in October because I want to separate the historical Patrick from all the things you might associate with him. Driving the snakes out of Ireland, green beer, uh, huge parades. In this case, the real person is a whole lot more interesting than all the legends that have come to surround him. And we can know the real Patrick because we have two documents he wrote. One is a story of his life and the other is a letter he wrote trying to affect change in his own society. And you can read these two documents in English translations in about an hour or so over a cup of coffee. So, who was the real Patrick? We meet him first as a teenage boy, 16 actually, living in the area of Great Britain that we call Wales in the 5th century AD. He was a Romano-British boy, which means that although Rome's footprint on the ground was gradually receding from Britain, there was still a flourishing of Roman culture in the region. Patrick was well off. He was being educated. He had learned to read and write in Latin. His family was Christian. His grandfather was a priest and his dad was a deacon. So this was a good church family, even if Patrick confessed to not paying much attention in church. So he was an ordinary teen from an ordinary family until the unthinkable happened to interrupt his ordinary life. Pirates were raiding the coast of Wales, Irish pirates. What did they take when they raided? I called Patrick well off, but his family were farmers, uh, getting their living from flocks and from soil. There was not much for pirates to steal, except the people themselves. The pirates made slaves of their captives. So in one terrible day, Patrick went from being an ordinary teenager to being enslaved, thrown in the hold of a ship with hundreds of other captives, cut off from family, from church, from homeland. He was taken to Ireland where he was sold in a slave market and put to work on a remote hilltop uh, as a shepherd. He had probably had trouble learning the language in this new land once because he was stuck with sheep all day and night, not a lot of people around. Uh, he talks about being cold, wet, hungry, frightened. Now, Patrick had probably been baptized, but his faith was a pretty shallow thing. His family were Christians, but as a teen teenager, he tended to tune out when spiritual matters were at hand. His Christian inheritance was some not something he owned personally, so he was a nominal Christian at best, no real relationship with God, no time to pray. But out there on the hilltop, watching the sheep, alone at night for hours, things were different. Patrick found plenty of time for praying. After all, he had no one else to talk to but sheep. And at some point on that mountain, things changed for Patrick, and he came to know the living God intimately. The inherited Christianity of his faith was transformed into a vibrant faith of his own. He doesn't say much about his conversion in the account, but it happened. What he does tell us is what came next. God spoke to Patrick. The scene reminds me of God speaking to the shepherd Moses in the wilderness. God said to the hungry, cold Patrick, 
It is good that you fast. Behold, your ship is come. And not fighting the call as much as Moses fought his, Patrick stands up, says goodbye to his sheep, and walks away across the country, all the way to the coast. No one stopped this runaway slave, and although penniless, he is able to navigate and negotiate his passage on a ship. He has a long journey home. We'll skip the details. It's a great adventure story, a real-life adventure story, if you like those. Um, I, he does get shipwrecked. And at one point, uh, he and his stranded companions are starving when a rough sailor says to him, are you a Christian, Patrick? And Patrick admits that he is. And the sailor orders him to pray. Patrick prays. They look up. There is a wild boar caught in a thicket. Barbecue. Now, if this story ended with Patrick's return to Wales, it would be an extraordinarily significant story historically. His account is the first narrative of an enslaved person taken beyond the edge of the Roman world who returned home to give us an account of it. But Patrick's return home is only the beginning of something even bigger. When Fat Patrick finally makes it home, guess what? Anybody ever tried to go back home? He's been living alone on a hill in Ireland for almost 10 years. He has a little trouble readjusting to life back at home. His education has been interrupted. Britons don't think highly of the Irish. Perhaps some of their smell had rubbed off on Patrick. So Patrick has trouble readjusting to life at home. One night he has a dream. A man comes to him carrying letters. On one of them is written, the voice of the Irish. In his vision, the people who had mistreated him, who had captured him, whom he had fled from, now wrote to him, begging him to return, saying, come and walk among us again. Patrick is not immediately convinced, but God is persistent. And eventually Patrick decides to return once again to Ireland. He began to see his childhood traumas were actually part of God's larger plan. He returned to Ireland, but not as a slave this time. He returned as a missionary. Let me read you about this in his own words. I did not go to Ireland of my own accord, not until I had nearly perished. But this was rather for my good, for thus I was purged by the Lord, and he made me fit so that I should labor and care for the salvation of others, whereas before I did not even care about myself. So Patrick returned to Ireland and embraced the smelly, ill-behaved Irish who had been his enemies as his own people, and more importantly, as the people of God. Later, reflecting back on his work as a missionary in Ireland, he wrote, Hence, how did it come to pass that those who never had a knowledge of God, but until now had always worshipped idols and things impure, have now been made the people of the Lord and are called the sons of God, that the sons and daughters of the kings of the Irish are seen to be monks and virgins of Christ? Patrick served the people of Ireland with dedication. And as a church leader, he was particularly concerned about the hardships of some of those of his own flock who suffered trauma. You see, it was not only the Irish who took the British as slaves, but British warlords enslaved Irish men and women. This happened to members of Patrick's own flock, and he was furious. I'm sure it brought back all the pain and suffering of his own youth. But Patrick was not silent. Rather, he spoke out bravely on behalf of captives, demanding their release. He knows the slave traders. Their leader is a warlord from Britain named Caroticus. And what piques Patrick's fury more than anything else is that Caroticus is nominally a Christian. How could a Christian enslave his own brothers and sisters in Christ? Patrick doesn't have much access to power at this point. He can't marshal a SWAT team and go in after the hostages. At this point, he's not, uh, he's not a miracle-working saint who can call down the power of heaven to stop the injustice in progress. Does he pray? Of course he prays. But then what? He turns to the only tool he has left, 
one that many desperate about injustice have resorted to. He tweets. Well, actually, he writes a letter. But there is no postal service. He has no address, no fax machine, no airdrop capacity. So he writes a public letter asking that anyone traveling to carry the message abroad, even into the presence of the warlord himself. It's an outspoken, powerful letter, shaming those who would use violence in this way and comforting the oppressed. He shows particular sensitivity to women in captivity, recognizing the sexual violence perpetrated against them. He charges Karataka, saying, You gave away girls as prizes, not yet women, yet baptized. So like Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr., Patrick appeals to the moral standard of the oppressor to make demands on behalf of the oppressed. So not only is Patrick the first enslaved person we know of to escape and tell his story, but he is the first author to challenge the institution of slavery. At least he's the first writer I know, after Paul wrote his epistle to Philemon on behalf of Onesimus, to challenge the very institution of human trafficking in writing. So how is this relevant for alumni and students of Gordon College? Patrick's early story does not bode well. When he was being violently made into a piece of property, his future seemed in grave jeopardy. We might easily have never heard about his, we may easily have never heard his name or heard anything about his story. But instead, this abused teenager was being prepared by God for a greater purpose. His shallow received faith became a living, vibrant faith which transformed not only his own life, but the lives of many. The gospel that Patrick carried to Ireland flourished. The church grew in Ireland. It was not long before Ireland had ceased to be a mission field and had begun to send missionaries. Irish missionaries carried the gospel across the continent of Europe. They left their homes and traveled wide, carrying the good news they established monasteries throughout what is today Scotland, Northern England, France, Germany, Switzerland. So Patrick's story is one of redemption, not only for him, but for many tribes and peoples to follow. God used Patrick's childhood trauma to redeem the sufferings of others. Patrick did not attend a Christian liberal arts college like Gordon. But the redemptive arc of his life is one that is relevant to many Gordon students, alumni, faculty. God's healing and redemption of Patrick led to the advancement of God's kingdom. We ask that the same power of God work in our own messy brokenness in our lives as well. Thank you.